Be courageous to write down that perhaps scary future that you'd love to, to create for yourself. Lean into possibility versus predictability. That would be one. And if we really want to grow as people and leaders and business folk, be courageous and ask for feedback and receive feedback. It's the only way that we're able to see our blind spots. And the blind spots are the things that when we release that, that that tethers us to the ground, when we release that, we'll become more free. This is the Play Your Position podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up, because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Hello, hello, Team PYP. Mary Lou Kayser here. Welcome to today's episode of the Play Your Position podcast. I am so glad you have decided to join me today and my amazing guest who is suited up and ready to take the field. He's going to take us into his leadership journey, what he is doing in the world today to make it a better place and inspire all of us to be the leaders of our lives. His name is Andy Height, and he's coming to us from Chicago, Illinois. Andy, are you ready for kickoff? I am so ready. If I had a drum, I'd be rolling the drum. <laughs> I, I wish I had a drum. That would be a, a great ad. Maybe I need to think about that. Uh, so team, let me share a few things about Andy, and then he's going to get to tell you what he is doing. He is a recognized leadership coach who supports entrepreneurs, executives, and their teams as they navigate the world of building businesses and lives filled with prosperity, meaning, and freedom. Regardless of the setting, be it in front of an audience, within an intimate boardroom, or during individual client sessions, Andy's background in commercial theater as an actor and executive lends a distinctive perspective to his coaching practice. Ooh, that's going to be fun to talk about. (laughs) He is really excited about this journey that he is on. He's passionate about helping his clients explore new possibilities, challenge their limits, and unlock their true potential. And he is, I can tell already, a lot of fun. So Andy, let's get right into it. Tell us your story. Give us the context of when you got the call to leadership and how getting that call has evolved into what you do today. I'm happy to. Uh, and first, let me say I love the metaphor to uh, football, huge football fan. Woo-hoo! Although a little, little scarred because my team... <laughs> He's not doing very well at all. And who's your team? Let's hear it now. Well, Get Chicago it out of the Bears, way. considering oh. they are about the worst in football. Oh. But not about, they are. Um, and we're last year and seem to continue down that path. Uh, but we won't dwell on that. We'll we'll get into the leadership conversation. Yes. So my first call into leadership, you know, I, I as I kind of reflect on that, it it would have to be in my previous career, which was in in theater. I was a producer, artistic director for about 15 years at a theater here in Chicago. And honestly, I think the call in, I, I didn't even know what leadership was, right? <laughs> That's honest. Um, yeah. I kind of, I, I didn't, frankly. I, I got promoted into a job and I quickly realized that while I was surrounded by beautiful humans, no one had a clue what they were doing from leader, uh, the leadership standpoint. Yeah. Um, it was, kind of the wild west and it drove me crazy i couldn't understand why we couldn't have clear messaging i couldn't understand why <laughs> we couldn't be consistent and everything was you know my my particular leader god love him wonderful human being just terrible leader so it kind of set me on a course to to figure things out because Oftentimes, when you're in an environment of poor leadership and poor communication and poor all of the above, it it creates a a situation where people are stressed, they're uncertain, there's a lot of anxiety. And I felt it in myself and in the teams that I was leading. And I thought, something's got to change. Because this is not what I signed up for. I signed up. Uh, we, we joked all the time, like this is theater, man. This this ain't like 
uh, brain surgery. This is theater. <laughs> We're just doing things to entertain people and hopefully change lives through entertainment. But we got to be having fun, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I just knew there had to be a different way. And asking that question um, set me off on a journey of discovering what leadership was and how it was different from management and and how do we do this thing where we enroll people and get them excited uh, and all the while doing the same work on ourselves because as you and I were talking before we we got started, self-leadership is required before any leadership is possible. Yep. Um, because we must build and grow who we are as humans and leaders before we can lead someone else down that path. And so it really required me to do a lot of personal work, a lot of self-reflection. It's where I I really was introduced to that, the phrase those old guys used to say, the the Stoics, know thyself. I'm like, right. what does this even mean? And then when I when I really dove into that, I could see a path where I could grow, my leadership could grow, the leaders that I was leading could grow. And it really kind of opened up this new world of how things get done, um, both internally and externally in an organization. Okay. Fascinating that you didn't really understand that phrase, know thyself. <laughs> no, I, 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 mean, I, I think yeah. that's fascinating because, I guess, because I've been in this space for as long as I have. And I've... Yeah. Ever since I was a kid, I was very self-aware and, but not everybody is. Right. And, and, and so I'm curious now that you're on the other side of that, Andy, when you're working with folks, how do you get people who are, were like you used to be to buy into what you're doing to help them know thyself, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I think uh, in this work, we we tend to work with folks that are kind of previous versions of ourselves, right? And that's why they resonate with us because we we share sort of spoken and unspoken traits. And so most of the people that come to me are whether they know it or not, they're thirsty for that kind of work. They're 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 really curious about how do I maximize my potential. I know that I'm here for more. I know that I'm meant to do something with, you know, these few rotations we have around this rock. And so whether or not they realize it, they, they, I think, subconsciously understand that they're signing up for this work. You know, most people will come looking to grow, build a business, working with their teams, working on their leadership, but they, they tend to be very open to the internal work, because as I explain it, that is the path to get to the the larger work, as it were. It is. It is. Okay. So there's there is an inkling. You 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 just said that that they have yeah. a sense that something needs to change. They they just don't know what. And so, as part of your work, what seems to be the the through line for the folks that you know when you look at them when they started? Yeah. To where when they exit your their time with you, and we're, everybody has a shelf life, right? Yeah. It's like your goal is to get them to a certain point. Is is that the ultimate goal? Is that you, they can say, "Wow, Andy, I really know myself now in a way I didn't." Or are there other outcomes that you're uh, that you love to to help people achieve? Absolutely, great question. You know what I <laughs> when I first started this work, I was like, I want to be a life coach. I want to change the world. I want to um, change the world one person at a time. Uh, the truth of the matter is that I learned when I uh, left my previous career and started this business and wanted to create a, a life of prosperity is that most people don't necessarily sign up to just know themselves, Mm -mm. (laughs) right? (laughs) Even though that's like the work that we love to do and ultimately that's the work that's done that gets them to the result. Most people are, they kind of want a tangible result that they can look to and say, oh, that time actually paid off. So, you know, most people will come in wanting to see some some ROI on their leadership, their their teams, their organizations, their business. Um, And truly that's what we focus on because when I... When I work with a client or a team, I want them to judge me and our work based on some results. Now, what ends up happening if, say, for example, I'm I'm working with a, a small company that's wanting to double their revenue, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oftentimes, what's going to happen is those 
those challenges, those obstacles, that friction that is the thing that gets in the way of them getting to that destination on their own is going to bubble up. Yep. And that's what we work on. And truthfully, that's the work of, oh, so you tend to be a little controlling, for example, <laughs> um, not allowing your team to do the work. Well, how is that going to work if you're looking to scale a business? And there is where we look at the individual. What is it about the fear of letting go control mm-hmm. is getting in your way of effectively doing that so that the people that you've brought in to do these roles can be free and creative and expressive and has some autonomy to help you grow. And so it always starts with that tangible goal that we're always judging the work against, but that brings up (laughs) the things that we need to work on so that they can then get to that result, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What have you noticed uh, the similarities between the work you do now and being in theater? Great question. You know, being in theater, the one thing that that we had to really or was really important to me is understand the humanity of the character mm-hmm. um, and the scene uh, and the show itself. Because if we're going to portray something, we really need to understand the the characters and the the person, for example, if I'm going to play the character, who is it? And that is in part the know thyself work, right? Asking those tough questions of the character. I used to coach actors um, in auditioning. And I found that the biggest piece of work that I would do is getting them out of their own head and into the character. Sure. Which is very similar Mm-hmm. <laughs> the work that I do with um, leaders and business owners. Let's get, let's move beyond the the sort of the filter that we've created from the past and our past experience. Let's move beyond that filter so that we can see the world with different clarity. Same thing with actors. So let's stop asking, what are they wanting to see? Or am I going to get the job? Or am I going to hit the high note? Uh, well, am I going to crack? Whatever. And actually just be in the moment. And that's what's required in business and in leadership is being willing to make a mistake, to be in the moment, because that's where we actually can make a difference is in the very moment. And truth truth be told, and I know you know this, Mary Lou, oftentimes the mistake is the very thing that is needed because that's the thing that's going to help us grow. Right. It's the most painful and yet it's the most powerful at the same time for the growth. Iron is forged in the fire, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and you said something earlier that is, I think, worth <laughs> emphasizing is people aren't signing up to work with coaches or, or programs because they're like, wow, I really don't know myself. Maybe there's yeah. one or two outliers, but generally speaking, that's not what brings people into the personal development, personal growth sphere. It's it's often much more uh, superficial and tangible. Yeah, and that and there's nothing wrong with that. It, it but to oh. your point, it's what what you discover. I know this has happened to me, and and I can tell it has happened to you as well. You get in into one of these these experiences, and you're suddenly faced with the truth. Yeah. Okay, I have a, I have another question. Having been in theater for as long as you have. What has been your favorite character to play and favorite play to be a part of? And they may not be Mm. one and the same. Uh, Excellent question. My favorite role that I've played, if you know a chorus line, Mm -hmm. um, I played Paul. Okay. Puerto Rican dancer that um, he's got like a 10 minute monologue in the second act. Uh, I adored that character. Okay. Um, Just a sweet man who was a victim of some just terrible circumstance and he's just trying to make it in the world. Right, right. Um, and do the best and be the best that he could possibly be um, against a lot of odds. So that was probably my favorite character. I think my favorite play was the last one I did. We did a, um, at Chicago Shakespeare, uh, we did an all-male version of Pacific Overtures, Sondheim musical. Oh, it I don't was, know that. I don't know that. Uh, it was amazing. And in fact, I'd retired uh, about a month after the show closed at Chicago Shakespeare in Chicago and started the the job that I mentioned previously. And the director calls me probably three weeks into the new job. Hey, we're moving the show to London. We can take three American actors and we want you to go. Is there oh. any way you can get three months off of your brand new job leading <laughs> four teams um, and join us in London for 
this uh, revival at the Donmar in London. And I was like, oh, Gary, I hate you. Why didn't you call me three weeks ago? So I didn't go. Oh, uh, you didn't? Okay. I didn't go. And it ended up winning the Olivier that year for Best Musical. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it was it was kind of the one that got away. Yeah. Um, but as things are, you know, had I done that, I might not be sitting here talking to you. So I have True. no regrets. Right. Yeah, that's such a great attitude to have. Uh, it's hard. I, I, you know, people make fun of, oh, no regrets. No, you know what? It, what is the point of regretting? How, how well, is that helping you? <laughs> totally. I mean, I remember an instance where I was re- I was up for a show that I really, really wanted, um, and I didn't get it. Okay. And so I took a different show. Um, it was actually a, a USO tour that took uh, four singers and four dancers to Europe and all throughout Europe. We were gone for a couple of months. And had I gotten the other show and not taken this show, I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't have my two teenage daughters Mm -hmm. and living in this house and living the life I I have. So I am really um, cognizant of the fact that we just kind of go with what life gives us. And it's kind of meant to be that way. Yeah, it absolutely is. And that's part of developing a leadership mindset is to accept that not every opportunity that comes across our, our desk is meant for us to pursue. Sometimes in your case, that the circumstances of having a new role and you couldn't, you you probably thought about it. It wasn't just a split decision. You probably sat down and thought, wow, could I do this? And then- Mary Lou, I almost quit that job. Did you? go do the show. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't. Oh, see? And and again, I mean, we that's that's part of uh of personal growth too is being okay with a, making a tough decision. Yeah. You know? Um yeah. and so well, and so ahead. often if I could just add on to that. Yeah, so often please. we 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 think whatever decision in front of us can be life and death, right? Without <laughs> realizing that you know, aside from some catastrophe or something or tragedy, we have a lot more spins around this rock, right? Um, and we have a lot more that we can do and iterate and create. I talk with young entrepreneurs a lot. And by young, I 20s, uh, early 30s. And I, I, I tell them, like, don't sweat it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, got, you could completely go bankrupt and crush it in life. You know, this is just part of the process of learning and growing. Do you find when you work with younger people that there is almost a par- a, um, they're paralyzed by failing despite all the memes and all the stuff online about, you know, fail forward and all da da da. But is, I, I'm just curious from a generational standpoint, what kinds of, of trends in, their ability to, uh, I guess, make decisions. Uh, do, yeah. you, do you see people being in, in indecision more than, than uh, I'm, I'm presuming you're a Gen Xer? Yeah. Uh, I am, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I definitely see that in my daughter's generation. In yeah. the teenager, early 20s. Gen Z. Definitely see that in that generation. Okay. Yeah, I think the social media part of... Well, yes, the the memes are great, but that's not me. Other people can do that, but I can't do it. It almost kind of pits them against their own ability and their Mm. own, you know, the Instagram life. Oh, this is what everybody else's life looks like. But here's the reality of mine, um, which I think is um, kind of terrible. Uh, Most of the people I work with don't seem to be, because again, they're, they're probably versions of me, don't seem to be necessarily strapped by fear they will make decisions. Uh, they'll often be strapped by imposter syndrome or they might take too long to make decisions because they want to be thoughtful and then miss an opportunity or mm. that kind of thing. Mm. Okay. So talk to us about that because I, I don't think that applies just to young entrepreneurs. I think a lot of people, in my experience has been in, in different settings when I was in, in formal education and certainly I've been in the podcasting space. I've been in, in you know, the, the whole online evolution space, as it were. Mm-hmm. And 
talk it to us about opportunities and being able to recognize them um, and tie that in with how you help people overcome the resistance to the changes that an opportunity presents because that's yeah. that's another piece to the puzzle. Well, I think what what happens is is most people get kind of trapped in this idea of certainty, right? So if there's an an opportunity in front of us, um, some will freeze or fold, fight, you know, whatever yeah, the, right. the response <laughs> is, right? Yeah. Um, based on what they think is certain. And the truth of the matter is, there is no certainty. Mm -hmm. Anything in the future is uncertain. And so part of the work that we have to do is to kind of collect facts around whatever the opportunity is or whatever the next move is and make the best decision possible in the moment, knowing because everything is uncertain that it we might have to shift when we when we get to that destination. It might not be the right destination. You know, oftentimes I talk to clients about a game that I we I imagine we all used to play as kids. Do you ever play the game Hot or Colder? Where somebody would hide something, you'd go look for it, and they'd yes. tell you if you're getting hotter or colder. Yes. I, I always tell people, be brave enough to do that in real life. Because it's oh. the only way to really go find the thing that you're looking for. The universe, the people around you, your circumstances are going to tell you if you're getting warmer or if you've moved in a direction where uh, it's just cold over there. And so it helps us tune into our intuition, which is a just a underutilized tool that we all have. Mm -hmm. um, just by risking being out there and playing that game, because the truth is we're not going to be certain. We can do all the work that, that we can to get the data, but there's so many other factors in this world, other people, market trends that we can't control. So make the best decision possible and listen for those cues. We're getting hotter, we're getting colder. Yeah, what... What's a, for example, on that, um, again, without violating any kind of client yeah. privilege, you know, client coach well, privilege, but just in, in a kind of a general, for instance, the um, something people could sink their teeth into? Yeah, it, it could be as simple as growing a team. You know, mm. do, I, do I hire an ops person? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Let's try it, <laughs> right? I mean, the data point that you're doing too much in the business and in order for you to scale the business, another person has to come in to do that work. And so we'll never know if it's the right person until a person gets in the seat. We'll never know if that's going to actually free the bottleneck until we get in there and do the thing. There's a lot of unknowns, but we take the data to say, okay, I can't do it all. I need somebody to do operations because my, my genius is, is more of a visionary and a creator. So let's move in that direction and listen to the cues that we get as an example. Okay. And sometimes it does just take jumping in. Well, and here's the exactly. <laughs> it takes the <laughs> the courage and vulnerability to jump in. You know, a lot of times too, some people will will they'll go forward with that. They'll hire the ops person and the person will be wrong. And then they will they'll automatically, from a place of fear, go, that was the wrong decision. Let's go back. Rather Ooh. than being exploratory and curious, well, maybe it was the right decision, the wrong person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. a lot of people, especially if they're looking for a lot of certainty in life, they'll look for their own confirmation bias. See, yes. it didn't work. Let's retreat. See, it didn't work. Let's retreat. No, let's be out in the world and listen for the true hot or colder. Yeah. Yeah. It's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast, and we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. Now, let's get back to the game. Oh, that's so interesting. I, I, what percentage of your clients, and again, I, I see someone like yourself, who's, you're going to get just that bell curve of folks. There are going to be yeah. a few on either side of the extreme and then most in the middle. I, I'm curious about what percentage of folks are those retreater types where they they took a risk and then it didn't work out and they're like, nope, going back. 
That's an excellent question. I'm looking to the right on my board is where I keep all of my Oh, you've got stats. My, nice. My, uh, <laughs> my uh, current clients. I would say probably only about 10 to 15% are the ones that are looking for confirmation bias. Interesting. Okay. It's partly too because Mary Lou, like I do some vetting yeah. of coachability and that kind of stuff before I actually get into work with with people. Sure, um, I really want to make sure that I am the right coach for them uh, and what they're up to, what they want to create is something that I'm comfortable doing and that they feel comfortable with me. So I spend a decent amount of time with folks before they sign up mm-hmm. for that very reason. You know, if somebody feels like they're maybe a little bit too constrictive um, and fearful to move forward. I have folks that I'm like, you are perfect for this person so that they can kind of do that work first. Um, and then I've had people come and, and then re-engage with me uh, after that. Interesting. So it, uh, what are your practices and or views on using, uh, I, I don't know if you do, do you use any kind of personality assessments or... Mm-hmm. or um, any kind of assessments. I mean, there's the Colby, there's obviously yeah. Myers-Briggs, there's the Enneagram, there's DISC, there's, you know, there's a, a bunch of them. Is that part of your your practice? And what are your overall thoughts about those as tools for knowing ourselves better? Yeah, excellent question. And uh, it's been on the spot a little bit, Mary Lou. I don't know what your thoughts are. And, <laughs> um, so the truth of the matter is I have a little bit of a, a skepticism to assessments. Okay, and that's fair. And it's not that they don't have value. I think what happens is a lot of, I would say the vast majority of folks abdicate their own intuition, mm. their own emotional intelligence, their own personal work. And then they rely on some assessment to tell them who this other person is. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that does both parties a huge injustice. Interesting. Because assessments, you know, at the best of times is telling us who we are today in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer that we can teach all dogs old and new, new tricks. Yeah. Um, And if, and if, we get a disc assessment and we assume, well, that's who I am forever. I, I think we're we're leaving a lot on the table. Now, all that is to say, I don't really... I do kind of like the Enneagram because mm-hmm. it talks more about traits rather than um, who you are. I, I use with my leaders a 360 that I personally love, which is the leadership circle profile. Mm-hmm. I've um, heard of that, sure. It 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 doesn't really say, here's who you are, or this is the kind of leader you are, it tells you what the data tells us in the moment. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't pretend to say you're a fixed leader. It it just collates data to say, this is how you're being experienced now. And these are your opportunities for growth. And and I really do like that, that approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to say, I did, I, I wasn't my intention to put you on the spot no, with that no, no, question. No, 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 I know that. <laughs> at all. I, no, I, no, no. I'm always curious what people think because I've, I have taken, you know, assessments over the years and I have found them very interesting, insightful. Yeah, but I love your point about we don't want to abdicate. Yeah. We don't want to abdicate our, you know, our efficacy, our... I can't think of the word I want right now, but you know what I mean. It's just yeah. it, use it as a tool to understand perhaps parts of yourself that you might not have recognized. Yep. And then be fluid. I mean, one of your keywords is evolve. You, evolve. We're always evolving. Yeah. Always evolving. I mean, I've taken a couple um, in the entrepreneurial world, especially super small business culture index. Is a I don't know if you've heard of that one. It's pretty big when it comes to hiring. Hmm. Hmm. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the assessment in particular. I mean, I've taken it twice and gotten two different results. So that tells you something. Yeah. Um, but like I say, I just see too often where people are leaning on it too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and and as you point out, abdicating their own leadership. Mm-hmm. Right? Because part of our leadership is being able to read people, being able to um, connect with people and to have empathy for people and to to bring out the the best something that they might a trait that they might not already have 
And if we lean too much on these assessments, I think we miss an opportunity. Yeah, it's it's it it can become too easy to pigeonhole folks yep. and not really see it within a larger context. Uh, and also, circumstances can play a role in how we are showing up. We all know that, and um, may not be may not be true what we're seeing. Um, so yeah. that's I really appreciate your candor about the pluses and minuses of yeah. of assessments in terms of uh, growing ourselves becoming more attuned to others. And I think ultimately, and that's what a great leader can do is read a room as best as possible. It's not going to be perfect, but have a sense about, oh, okay, this is the vibe. And sometimes that requires abandoning what we thought we were going to talk about because the room doesn't want that. Yeah. Well, and not to belabor this point, but like think about a leader who's hiring, right? Mm-hmm. If they solely lean on some assessment, they rob themselves of the ability to hire the wrong person and understand why, right? Oh, it's yeah. easy to blame the assessment or maybe this got it wrong, but part of our job as leaders is honing those abilities. Yeah. Right? So that when we're, you know, seasoned in 10, 20, 30 years in, We know how to hire based on our own evolution and learning, um, not continuing to lead on a tool. Right. Yeah, tools are only as good as the person using the tool. (laughs) That's exactly right. (laughs) And if you put the wrong tool in their hand, you know, you can't cut down a tree with a hammer. I mean, maybe you could pound on it long enough and chip away, but it's not the most efficient way of doing it. And nor is it the, it really is not a, a good fit. Yeah. And um, yeah, so interesting. So how do you keep your saw sharp since we're in the tool metaphor yeah, here? Let's, what, keep, let's keep going down that. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, always mixing my metaphors. <laughs> oh, but now we're on the playing field. Oh, now we're using tools. <laughs> um, I'm so allowed. <laughs> I have in my corner some, uh, some people that are really great at sharpening the saw blades for me. Good. Uh, helping me keep it. You know, I, I work with a coach. I will always work with a coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe in the power of coaching um, because I see it, experience it, and and it, you know, is evident in my own life and leadership. So that's how I, I stay sharp. I have somebody constantly challenging me um, and helping me see things in new ways and, and growing so that I can do that more effectively for those that I'm working with and leading. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, I love when I hear coaches have coaches. I, how can we, how can we get better without somebody there who holds us accountable, challenges our thinking, it, it, someone we can just bounce an idea off of and, and yeah. have them say, is that really the direction you want to go based on what you've been saying for the last six months or whatever it may be, right? Yeah. So, and I'm going to say something that might be challenging to some of the coaches out there. (laughs) Oftentimes, I will speak with a potential client and and I'll encourage them, you know, go talk to other coaches. And whether in that conversation or others, people will ask me, what should I look for in a coach? And one of the things that I always say is ask them if they're working with a coach. Yes. And if they say no, doesn't mean they're not a good coach, but I would question it. Right. If we're mm-hmm. if we're out in the world saying, I can help you literally change your life, your business, your relationships, any of those things, and we're not up curious about or up to that work ourselves, um, and wanting to do it meaningfully, it just raises a question mm-hmm. for me. And people are always like, That's inc- that's amazing. That's such a good question. Because I think, you know, again, good leaders are the ones doing the work. Yeah. And to your point earlier. Circumstances change, challenging us to show up differently. And sometimes things happen in a very quick fashion that uh, we find ourselves in uncharted territory. Yeah. And if, I mean, there's two choices. You can fumble around on your own, and a lot of people do. And sometimes that's what needs to happen in order to decide, I don't want to do this anymore alone. Or they realize right away, I, I got to get help now. Yeah. Well, and that's on one side of the spectrum. On the other is, you know, I'll use Michael Jordan since I'm in Chicago. Yeah, Michael yeah. Jordan didn't wait until 
he was losing or wasn't great at his sport. He employed a coach, a mentor, someone who's going to help him become better all throughout because he wanted to be the best he could be, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's really what's on offer and where the real power of coaching can support folks is when things aren't bad, when they're not in a hole or in trouble, right? Because oftentimes we're, we're helping somebody get out of the hole or in trouble or get back to sort of level playing ground. Well, that's great and all, but is that the only kind of life or business you want? Or you want one that's like thriving and, and firing on all cylinders? Yes. Wow. Great point. Because I think many people do associate hiring somebody when things are bad. Yeah. And they don't, and when things are going well, well, why? I, I don't need anybody. Things are going great. And that's actually faulty thinking. Yeah. Well, and because, Mary Lou, um, a lot of people <laughs> aren't courageous enough to, in their mind, create a really compelling future for themselves. Oh, no, definitely right? not. We, we'll create a future for ourselves if we're looking down the line that is predictable, that which we kind of have the skill and know how we get, right? I, I want to move from making $80,000 to $100,000. Well, that doesn't really require a big shift in who you are, right? But I want to stop working for a company and create my own company that's making $3 million. Now that is a planting a stake in the ground that's going to require some work that is totally possible for most people, but it's too scary. It's too uncertain. Nobody, they don't know how to go from point A to point B. So we don't even attempt the first step. And that's where I think coaching can be the most powerful is to bring out the true potential in someone if they're willing to walk down that road. Yes. And that's the key word there, willing. Yeah. You know, a mentor that I continue to follow who's uh, no longer alive, but I have, you know, his work and, and review it regularly. One of his questions is that you have to ask yourself is uh, when you're facing a big, scary kind of a goal, am I willing? Am I able? Well, yeah, I'm willing and yeah, I'm able. So then what are you, what are you waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, yeah. and, and it, it does come down to comfort. It really does. People, and I'm, I raise my hand sometimes. I was, I was laughing to myself. I don't know, earlier this summer, I, I was reflecting on something and, and I said, I was in a mood and I said, you know what, right now, I really just want to be comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I was like fighting against this massive growth that I've been a part of for quite some time. And, and I just, I was tired. Yeah. And I think it's okay to admit every now and then that as leaders, we do get tired and it's not that we're quitting and it's not that we're not putting the work in and it's not that we've gotten lazy. It's just that we need space for reflection and rest. Rest. Is so critical because we live in a culture that is is productivity, productivity, productivity. And you know what? Frankly, I I'm all for being productive when it makes sense, but not yeah. at the at not at my expense. It's not. A hundred percent agree. And I have a I have a football little analogy for you on this one. Great. Right? We love the sport. Those guys are are out there on Thursdays, Sundays, and Mondays, and they are banging the hell out of each other and themselves, yeah. right? And that's what they that's what they train to do. Well, come Monday and Tuesday, what it, what is the most important thing that they can do? Rest, rest repair their body, yep, rejuvenate. Yep. A training a rest day is a training day. Yes, it is as important as game day because. If they had seven game days in a row within a week, they'd be out of the the off the team mm-hmm. injury. And I think that's one of the things that that especially in our culture in the U.S. Um, and very driven people have a hard time with is knowing when to take their foot off the gas. Yeah, when it's appropriate and actually the best thing they can do for themselves, for their company, for their work, training themselves to give themselves that permission. Because a rest day is a training day. It is. I know people who run small businesses who take one week of vacation a year. One oh week. 
And I and and what I hear them say is, I'm self-employed. I I I can't. I I can't take time off. I have to keep working. And I think the best thing you could do for your business is to take some time off because yeah. not only are you rejuvenating yourself, but you're proving that you've built something that can function without you. And that's that's a good thing. Yeah. And if they're willing, back to the yeah, willing. Back to willing. Yep. And uh, able, engage a mentor, a counselor, or a coach, or someone mm-hmm. that can help them get over that hump because they are the bottleneck for their own business. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if you know Marshall Goldsmith's book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Yes, I do. Unless they up-level who they are, they will continue to work 51 weeks a year. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to me. Uh, I know from my studies th- uh, over the years, the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Mm-hmm. And I imagine that after your vetting process, you work mostly with growth mindset or people who have more leaning towards that. Maybe they're yeah. not, they haven't cultivated that part of themselves to the degree that say you and I have, but yeah. they're not so locked into the way things are and can't see beyond what the story they've been telling themselves. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And to add on to that, I, I think by definition, if you have a fixed mindset, you're not coachable. Because you're not. you're not able to see beyond your own limitations. Yeah, you're not able to see new possibility. You're not able to even see your own um, blind spots when they're shown to you. No, and so some one must have some amount of growth mindset in order to be coachable. Yes, yes, hundred percent. So, team, I hope you you're taking notes here. Growth mindset is is a, a piece of that, and and obviously, Andy. This is what he lives and breathes. And I mean, your your whole demeanor is so fun. I mean, I think it's your theater background. It's you're very expressive. Uh, You have a lot of energy. And you're also, you tell it like it is. Like there's no sugarcoating here. You know, entering into a coaching relationship is going to require work. And a good coach like yourself is going to challenge, you know, a person to... You know, it's sometimes it's like the remember that ice bath that was popular early in the days of the internet, where everybody was getting a bucket of ice water yeah. thrown on their head. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Sometimes it, it can be shocking when someone calls <laughs> you out on your blind spot, and it, I mean, you, you kind of your head spins around. You go, "Wait a minute, what?" And then you realize, "Oh yeah, that is what's keeping me from making the leap." Or uh, getting out of this situation that has, I've just been miserable, but you know, misery loves company, right? So a yes. lot of times <laughs> uh, people almost, they don't know how to be anything other than miserable. And if they let that go, what what do they have? Right. And the misery, it's the devil you know beats the devil you don't. Right. I know what this misery feels like. Yep. I, I know I can cope with it, even though I dislike it. Mm-hmm. That thing off into the future that I can't really see, that misery could be worse. So I'm going to stay here. Yep. And that is just, you know, our our mind playing games with ourselves based on old programming. And yeah. part of what we can do as good coaches is help people see beyond that and then take baby steps out of that comfort zone to kind of look at the landscape and go, oh, I, I I can work outside of this comfort zone. Yeah. And you can. I mean, I'm I am living proof. And I, so are you. <laughs> you know, you and I have both been on our own journeys. Yeah. Uh and and it continues, you know. Um, so for people who are are interested in learning more about your services, Andy, where do you hang out online? I think my my primary place to hang is LinkedIn. Um, easy to search Andy Height. Um, there's not a ton of us there. Uh, yeah, probably the only coach uh, or one of a few. My my picture is me looking into a camera with a hat on. I almost always have a hat on. Uh, one of the things that I decided when I left uh, work and went became an entrepreneur is I'm going to wear any damn thing I want. Any <laughs> I want. I yes. hate people telling me what to do. So. Uh, I'll often have a hat or a sweatshirt or a flannel on. Yeah, nice. so LinkedIn um, or my website, 
scalingminds.com, like scaling a business, but scalingourminds.com. There's, I, I've created a page, if that's okay, for yeah. your listeners. If you go to scalingminds.com slash PYP, I have a couple of assessments there that, you know, a leadership assessment, an entrepreneurial fitness assessment that looks at just business fundamentals, leadership, uh, mindset, all those things to kind of help get a people a, um, an idea of where they set. Um, and there's also a link there if, if anybody is more interested in having a conversation with me or experiencing some coaching, there's a link there. Let's set up some time and um, have a conversation. That's what I love to do. Yes. Yes. So team, take advantage of these wonderful resources that Andy is offering. There'll be a link to this particular page on his website, um, on his show notes page at pyppodcast.com. And I know many of you are listening on your phone. There's going to be a link right there it, under the title of this conversation. So it, I've made it so easy for you to connect with these amazing guests. And if anything, follow Andy on LinkedIn and just keep up with the posts that he puts out there. Um, you know, all of us are uh, committed to great content and sharing resources and also insights. So um, take advantage of that. And you shared with us at the beginning, you're very sad about your Chicago Bears right now. So there's your team. But you know what? Yeah, Again, you had to bring it all the way around uh, to the I, thing you know, that I'm an old, I'm a former, <laughs> I'm a former English teacher. So I have to like, you got the, <laughs> it's like with theater, you have the, you know, it's the circle, right? Yes. You start and you end. Um, but but no, I mean, they will come back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you got nowhere to go but up, Mary That's Lou. right. That's right. Um, and you mentioned the Marshall Goldsmith book, but are there any other books, Andy, that have been instrumental for you on your leadership journey that you either turn to regularly or maybe have read recently that you could recommend to us? Yeah, I mean, gosh, there's so many. I, know. I love <laughs> things that make me think about me first as a leader. So mm -hmm. things like The Untethered Soul, Oh yeah, Michael Singer. Victor Frankel's book about, you know, um, what is Victor Frankel's book? Is it Man's Search for Meaning? Yeah, Man's Search for Meaning. You know, it all comes down to our personal choice. Um, I love those two books and often will gift them to clients. Mm -hmm. um, I love things like, uh, for my clients, weekly coaching conversation. Just a fable, a book around how to be a best leader and leader's coach. Nice. Are you familiar with that book? I'm not. I'm writing down the books that Super you mentioned. Super easy read. Great for your leaders who are leading people. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a good reminder that we need to... Uh, leadership is active. Yeah. And it, it's not just when things are falling apart. If we have a regular cadence of checking in with our people and finding out what they need and how things are going, um, it's how we scale our leadership. Yeah. And honestly, that's one of the things that I hear from listeners that they really appreciate about conversations like what we just had is it keeps them in that cadence. I love that word. And books and then finding the right coach for you and being committed to personal growth just makes life so much more rewarding and opens up opportunities that take us from point A to point B. X or Y, yeah. you know, you make that big leap and and you aren't just doing a parallel move, but you're really entering a new sphere. And it sounds like that's part of your commitment to your clients, Andy. And I just have loved what we've talked about today. And I'd like to leave the last word to you. What, what words of wisdom can you uh, leave Team PYP after our great conversation today? You know, I think it would be two if if I might have two. You is might. Be courageous to write down that perhaps scary future that you'd love to, to create for yourself. Lean into possibility versus predictability. That would be one. And if we really want to grow as people and leaders and business folk, be courageous and ask for feedback and receive feedback. It's the only way that we're able to see our blind spots. And the blind spots are the things that when we release that, that that tethers us to the ground, when we release that, we'll become more free. 
Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year. Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills, they never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now. pypodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's pypodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at pyppodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform.